Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are on lesson seven and that's rest, relationship and healing. And before we get started, I wanted to mention a few people that we have on our prayer list and that would be uh, Randy Anderson's sister-in-law, Joanna, Paul Marie's son, Sean, and granddaughter, Sophia, and then Russell, Helen West, Gilmer and Mabel, Lori and Phil, Carol Haynes, Nellie and Victor, Sandra, John and Elva, Josette, Pete and Effie, and then Josie's cousins, uh, Cynthia and Dennis. And then we wanted to uh, just mention answered prayers for uh, Ruth's son, Jonathan, who uh, was discharged from the hospital. So we'll go ahead and start with prayer if we can bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here safely and in health to study your word. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and give us the wisdom and understanding that we need to learn the true meaning of forgiveness. Help us to forgive as you forgive. Help us to love as you love. We know, Lord, if we can't forgive, we remain victims. Lord, bless us to have a heart of flesh for those we love and for those that are difficult to love. Help us to see everyone with glasses tinted with grace. Heal our broken hearts and our minds from past hurts and offenses. Please remember those on our prayer list. Lord, you know each one's needs. Please bless them according to your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Doug Batchelor on Amazing Facts this week shared the story of the butler and the baker. And while he's in prison, and that's Joseph, you'll remember that the Pharaoh evidently had a party and someone tried to poison him. They weren't sure who it was. And the two who were the prime suspects was either the butler or the baker. The butler and the baker were in prison with Joseph and they both had dreams and they didn't know what their dreams meant. And Joseph gave them some time and attention, interpreted their dreams for them, and everything happened exactly as Joseph foretold. He said that the baker was going to be executed after three days. And after three days, they must have had some investigation in the palace and found out that it was the baker that tried to poison the pharaoh. And the butler was absolved and restored to his position. And Joseph said to the butler, I know this is what's going to happen, he says. When you get back to the palace, please intercede for me. I was falsely accused and I'm an innocent man. The very fact that my interpretation is coming true will show you that God is with me and I'm not lying. And remember me, he said, remember me. So after the butler was released, he didn't really remember him very promptly. Joseph spent another two years in prison. Joseph has spent a total of uh, 13 years in Potiphar's house and in prison. He was 30 years old when he got out of prison and interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. He was 40 years old when he faced his brothers who were asking, asking to buy food from him. The butler remembered about Joseph when the Pharaoh had a couple of strange dreams. He told the Pharaoh how Joseph had interpreted his dream and the baker's dream. Joseph did not claim he was the one interpreting the dreams, but glorified God instead. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer. And that's Genesis 41, 16. In addition to interpreting the dream, the seven years of abundance, followed by the seven years of famine, he suggested a plan to overcome the seven years of famine. Pharaoh promoted him to prime minister. He was 30 years old at the time. And he was also married um, to Aseneth. And they had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. The story of Joseph does not end with his success as prime minister of Egypt. Joseph had to face his past during the first year of famine. His brothers came to him. The circumstances were entirely different to the last time they had met. He could choose between punishment or forgiveness. What would he do and why? So this week we will cover, has anything changed? Have they repented? Should I forgive them? Who should take the first step? And then what happens next? So on Sabbath uh, afternoon, we had our memory text and that was Genesis 45, four, and it says, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Pastor Doug on Amazing Facts shares the biblical allegories of Jesus. There are three really powerful types of Christ in the Bible characters. One is David, who's a type of Christ. Jesus was also called the son of David. 
One is Moses, the great mediator, the deliverer, the prophet, the judge, the lawgiver. And the other is Joseph. Joseph sold by his brothers for a price of a slave for silver. And then he feeds the world, all fed this bread of life by Joseph. He separated from the father for the purpose of saving his people. There's a number of allegories of Jesus in the life of Joseph. He was forgotten in prison and all the disciples forsook Jesus and fled. <clears throat> so on Sunday, we have facing the past and then we'll be reading Genesis 42, seven to 20. And I'll start off. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked from the land of Canaan, they replied to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. So Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as the Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this palace unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother and the rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you're telling the truth. If you're not, then as surely as the Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in the custody, in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live. For I fear God, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. So our question was, why the elaborate plot by Joseph? What was Joseph trying to do with this first meeting? And our answer was Joseph's brothers had not recognized him because he was only 17 years old when they sold him into slavery. And he was about 40 years old at this time and the second in command in Pharaoh's palace. His intention was not to give up his identity right away because he was trying to find out the status of his father, Jacob, and his brother, Benjamin. He needed to know that both were alive and well. He was afraid his brothers might have killed his brother, Benjamin, due to jealousy. Jacob had not sent Benjamin with him because he was afraid some calamity might fall on him as it did with Joseph. Joseph wanted them to return with Benjamin the next time they came back to Egypt for food. Joseph accused them of being spies in prison and imprisoned them for three days before releasing all but Simeon. Simeon was one of the brothers who wanted to kill Joseph. Simeon most likely spent about eight months in prison before his brothers returned with Benjamin. So they were not spies. However, Joseph remembered they were jealous, envious murderers, and they wanted to kill him. Had they treated Benjamin the same way they treated him, were they taking care of their elderly father? Caring for the weak and defenseless was one of the biblical principles Joseph had embraced. Abuse within the family is one of the most serious because it is usually kept quiet. No physical, sexual, or emotional abuse can be tolerated. Outside professional help must be sought when we have knowledge of such abuse. Fortunately, his father and his brother were fine. The situation had changed. It appeared that his brothers had their conscience bothered all those years and had a change of heart. So Pastor Doug had this to say regarding Simeon's imprisonment. And like we had said, Simeon may have spent eight months or a year in jail while they ate up all the food they bought from Joseph. We don't know, but they bought a whole caravan worth of grain. So it took at least months to eat all that. Joseph decided to imprison Simeon because he was the brother who wanted to kill Joseph all those many years ago. The brothers did not return to Egypt right away with Benjamin. First of all, Jacob refused to let Benjamin go because he favored him and remembered what had happened to Joseph and did not want the same calamity to fall on Benjamin. Okay, next we'll be reading Matthew 25, 41 to 46. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, 
you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So the question was, why does Jesus take abuse or neglect of others so personally? Our answer is because we're all God's children and we're created in his image and God loves each one of us. So to abuse or neglect any of his children is an attack on God. Remember what we have done to the least of the brothers you've done unto God. While forgiveness needs to happen for healing to begin, forgiveness does not mean letting an abuser continue his or her abusive patterns. Biblical forgiveness is not condoning or excusing what someone has done or trying to pretend that it did not happen. Forgiveness means that we turn our resentment, our hurt, and our desire for revenge over to God. So we had a discussion question that says, what are some biblical principles that you need to apply to whatever difficult family relationships you are now experiencing? And we put forgiveness is an important biblical principle. It is a difficult thing to do, especially when the hurt goes very deep. We have to remember that this is what Jesus had done throughout his life and then his death. We have to ask for his strength to be able to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean we condone what the offender had done, but it will be for our own mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being. So Joe Marconi on 3ABN shared four points regarding abuse. Number one, there is no excuse for abuse. So Proverbs 10, 6 said, blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Number two, God hates abuse. Psalm 11, 5 says, the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Number three, abuse is never your fault. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And last, number four, God can bring deliverance, healing, and restoration. And 2 Samuel twenty two forty seven says, The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God, God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. So we'll go ahead and move on to Monday. And that was setting the stage. And we're going to go ahead and read Genesis 42, 21 to 24. They said to one another, Surely you are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. So our question was, what did Joseph overhear and what did he learn about his brothers? Well, first of all, all his, uh, his brothers spoke Aramaic and Joseph was fluent in speaking the Egyptian language. And so they were speaking through an interpreter. They did not know that Joseph knew Aramaic as well. So what Joseph hears is that the brothers are remorseful for what they had done to Joseph years ago. They knew what they had done to him was wrong. This had touched Joseph's tender heart that he broke down and cried privately. Joseph had forgiven his brothers a long time ago, but he had not forgotten. The story of Joseph is about redemption, forgiveness, and unification. So this story would have been hugely different if he had chosen hate and resentment instead. Joseph could have killed them right there and then. However, he did not want to res However, he also did not want to restore his family relationship if there was a risk of being abused by his brothers again, and that's why he tested them. His brothers did not know that Joseph could understand their language, so they spoke openly and showed their remorse. Can you imagine 23 years of remorse? Joseph was convinced after some other tests, like the, uh, the test of the alleged theft of the silver cup, 
Joseph showed favoritism towards Benjamin, but his brothers did not show jealousy or envy, but protected Jen Benjamin. And uh, specifically Judah was protecting Benjamin. And this is found in Genesis 43 and Genesis 44. So on Tuesday, we had forgive and forget. And we're gonna read Matthew 18, 21 to 35. And that's the parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience, patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him of the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So our question is, considering this text, what does forgiving others do for us? And our answer is, when we forgive, we become compassionate. We possess the heart of Jesus. Our lesson states that forgiveness is defined as a willingness to abandon one's right to resentment, condemnation, and revenge toward an offender or a group who acts unjustly. It is an intentional act. Forgiveness does not mean there will be no consequences or we accept abuse, but it means that we turn our resentment and our desire for revenge over to God. A very important key to learning how to forgive is to truly understand how God has forgiven us. We all have sin and we don't deserve forgiveness. Yet by God's grace and mercy, he offered his forgiveness Joseph offered that second chance to his brothers. He put the past behind him in order to move forward with love and acceptance. So what if Joseph's brothers had not repented or changed at all? Should, we for, should he have forgiven them? Well, genuine forgiveness involves forgiving others, even if they do not deserve it or if they have not asked to be forgiven. God's forgiving love is unconditional, even when we don't deserve it. Victims often feel that justice is the prerequisite for reconciliation, reconciliation. Someone has to pay for the hurt and pain that evil causes before there can be reconciliation. But Christians can forgive and leave behind the pain and the hurt because Jesus has paid the price. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it states, For he had made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God, for him. In, in, Ro him. in Romans 4 7 says, We forgive because God has forgiven us. And then Romans 3 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need forgiveness and grace every minute of our existence. Praise God that He is compassionate. When we forgive others, our bitterness goes away. The past is left behind, and we can go on with love and acceptance. As we practice forgiveness, we catch a glimpse of God's joy, gladness, warmth, and character that transforms our entire being. We begin to enter his rest. So Shelley Quinn on 3ABN shared this on what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is number one, intentional. Number two, forgiveness is the essence of our faith. God's love is a source of relational forgiveness. It is the non-negotiable act of obedience. Matthew 18, 21 and 22 says, Then Peter came to him and said, 
Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Number three, we have to recognize that ultimate justice belongs to God and on the offender's behavior. And number four, God cannot forgive us if we don't forgive our brother. And Matthew 18, 35 says, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So forgiveness is not, number one, it doesn't condone sin. Number two, it doesn't mean we forget what had happened to us. Number three, it is not a guarantee that the offender has changed their behavior. Number four, it's not naively restoring trust. And number five, it is not easy to do. So we'll go ahead and move on to Wednesday, making it practical. And we have a, a text, Luke 23, 34, it states, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So what does Jesus's declaration on the cross tell us about the timing of forgiveness? Our answer is we forgive even to the point of death. There is no circumstance where we should not forgive others. Sometimes the offender does not know they have offended, so we forgive at all times. So Luke 6.28 says, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And then Matthew 5.44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So the question in our lesson says, what do the above texts that Tom just read teach us about how we relate to those who hurt us? Well, we pray for them. We bless them. We love our enemies. This is a difficult thing on our own power, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to do this. With God, all things are possible. That's Mark 10, 27. It's easy to bury our feelings rather than working through them. But we can feel free to tell God how we've been hurt, our brokenness, our devastation, and how angry and resentful we are, and to give us the healing, the peace, and the comfort. We trust God to bring this healing to you, and trust God to bring this healing to you. Forgiveness is a choice. It's intentional. We don't wait till we feel like it or wait for the offender to ask for forgiveness. When we are hurt by others, some wounds may be devastating. We may feel shattered, embittered, and angry. Should I keep that hate and bitterness until the offender asks for forgiveness? I am the one who must decide whether to forgive or not. We can share our anger with God. Once we have taken our resentment to God, there's only one way ahead, and that's forgiveness. Jesus is the ultimate example. On the cross, he asked God to forgive his executioners. Father, forgive them for they for they do not know what they do. Pastor John Dinsey on 3 ABN shared how anger can damage us, not only spiritually and emotionally, but physically. And he apparently got these statistics from um, a Christian Health Magazine. Number one, two hours after an angry outburst doubles our chances of having a heart attack, increases our stroke risk, and weakens our immune system. Number two, having repressed anger makes us twice at risk for coronary heart disease. And number three, we need to practice constructive anger. This is dealing with our anger in a problem-solving manner with the offender. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 states, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So on Thursday, we have finding rest after forgiveness. And then we had um, some uh, text here, and that was Genesis 50, 15 to 21. And that says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and, their, and for their sin, for they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the trespass of the servant of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also <coughs> went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. 
Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. <laughs> I'm going to sneeze. Sorry about that. <laughs> Bless you. So what are Joseph's brothers worried about, and why would they be worried about it? What does this fear say about them? Well, Joseph was second in command, and he had the power to kill his brothers if he had sought revenge, and they knew this. Now, when Jacob passed away, they feared this would be the time that Joseph would seek vengeance. Joseph saw the bigger picture of God's purpose in blessing him during his life in Egypt. He had the love and compassion and forgiveness of God in his heart. What this says about the fear that his brothers had was that they truly did not have a close relationship with God and did not fully understand the true meaning of biblical forgiveness. The brothers had been living in Egypt for 17 years already and still feared that Joseph would take, it, take revenge. They knew that they had hurt Joseph deeply. The lesson states, if the wound is deep, we will probably have to forgive many times. In Genesis 50, 20, it says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. So the question in our lesson says, how does this verse help explain, at least partially, Joseph's willingness to forgive his brother's sin against him? Well, Joseph knew that God was with him the whole time and blessed him in every way because God had a divine purpose for Joseph's life. This plan was to help save the then known world from famine and to help his family fulfill God's promise to become a great nation. So finally, Joseph's family was reconciled. Although everything looked perfect, there were some wounds that had not healed completely. After Jacob died, Joseph's brothers felt remorse and fear again. Had Joseph's forgiveness been genuine? How many times should I forgive the same offense? All the times that are necessary until the wound is healed. Joseph's forgiveness was not based on his feelings, but on his principles. He forgave them as God had forgiven him. He had understood God's plan for him. There is no place for resentment in God's plan for us. So a well-known quote goes like this. Unforgiveness is like taking a poison and waiting for the offender to die. Unforgiveness only hurts us. This quote is from a Christian author, Louis B. Smees. He says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner is you. So Pastor Doug on Amazing Facts explained more on forgiveness. After we've received the forgiveness of Christ, like the parable of the unmerciful debtor, the king forgives him first, this servant who owes this incredible debt. After the king forgives the man, he doesn't then pass it on. Then he loses his forgiveness. The mercy of Christ, once you receive it, will not stay alive in a heart that will not share it with others. A lot of professed Christians have been stifled in their experience for years because they are still angry and bitter against someone else that has hurt them. They don't know how to forgive and to let it go. And if you don't learn that lesson, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have God do unto you. It tells us in Matthew 18, he was handed over to the tormentors till he should pay his entire debt. The forgiveness of Christ for his sins had been canceled and he had to pay his own debt. That's a pretty sobering thought. So how important is that we forgive each other? There's a general that once said to John Wesley, I never forgive and I never forget. And then Wesley responded, then sir, I hope you never sin. Pastor Loma King on 3ABN explained the six steps to forgiveness. Number one, it starts with a personal confession. Admit your guilt in the transgression. So 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number two, personal repentance lifts our burdens. Acts three nineteen says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Number three, forgive one another. Colossians 3.13 says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even has as Christ forgave you, so also must do. 
you also must do. Number four, use a peaceful approach. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which one, which no one will see the Lord. Number five, explain specifically the offense and rebuke with tenderness. Luke 17, 3 says, take heed to yourself if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if you repent, forgive him. And number six, there will not necessarily be a reconciliation. Of the offender may not want to reconcile or admit wrongdoing. It takes two people to reconcile. Luke 23, 34, then Jesus said, For God, uh, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do, and they divided his garments and cast lots. So he also shared five points on what reconciliation is. So number one is realization that there is a problem. Proverbs 28, 13 states, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Number, number two, identification emphasizing and explaining the grievance be specific and then number three preparation romans twelve eighteen. if it is possible as much as it depends on you live peaceably with all men and then number four is activation james five sixteen. confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much so put it into practice and then number five it is required of the one offended matthew 5 23 and 24 therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you leave your gift there before the altar and go your way first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift so it means it's not required of the offender but it is required of the offended on Friday, we have a reading from Mrs. White's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 239 to 240. As Joseph was sold to the heathen by his own brothers, so Christ was sold to his bitterest enemies by one of his disciples. Joseph was falsely accused and thrust into prison because of his virtue. So Christ was despised and rejected because his righteous, self-denying life was a rebuke to sin. And though guilty of no wrong, he was condemned upon the testimony of false witnesses. And Joseph's patience and meekness under injustice and oppression, his ready forgiveness and noble benevolence toward his unnatural brothers represents the Savior's uncomplaining endurance of the malice and abuse of wicked men and his forgiveness not only of his murderers, but of all who have come to him confessing their sins and seeking pardon. So here are four qualities that precede God's forgiveness and will result in the healing of the land. Number one, we need to humble ourselves. Number two, we need to recognize our true condition. Number three, we pray to God who is the only one capable of saving us. And then finally, number four, we turn from what will ultimately destroy us. Psalm 86, 5 states, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. And Ephesians 4, 32, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So in summary, we had Christ Object Lessons, page 251. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's grace. And um, this is just an extra, you know, um, reference on forgiveness. Pastor Loeb McCain of 3ABN has a two-hour presentation on YouTube, and it's called more powerful than forgiveness for anybody interested so that uh wraps up lesson seven rest relationship and healing we'll go ahead and close with the word of prayer okay father in heaven thank you father for the sabbath day and thank you for um this blessing and thank you for everything that you do for us and thank you for the power for us to forgive and thank you for your mercy in your heavenly name we pray amen amen